Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in, in Ottawa, and I'm very pleased to be here. So um, could have told you I, I probably know a little bit more about Canada than, than most uh, U.S. citizens. And where do, where do I get this knowledge? Um, well, these days, it's, um, it, it, well, it has been mainly from, from uh, podcasts. Um, but then lately, I discovered a, a new source, which has replaced all, all other sources. And one thing I learned from that source is what you can see about Canadian football. Um, but, but actually, um, that, that isn't really from 24-7. It's actually from, from SCTV and it's part of the um, Canadian content, which I, this counts as the Canadian content of my lecture. And I've understand, understood that having Canadian content is important in all parts of Canadian media, as, as even has been reported in the, the States. Even The Economist has had a story on that recently. OK, I'd just like to start out by acknowledging um, some of the people I work with on, for the material that's going to be presented in, in this talk. And um, it gives you a little bit of a sense of what, I'm, what I'll be um, talking about. So as Dale mentioned, I'm sort of part of different um, elements that are all essentially at the same campus in, in Baltimore. Um, but um, at the University of Maryland um, School of Medicine, um, there's a, a team and includes people from um, from the Department of Physical Therapy and, and Rehabilitation Sciences, um, including my um, current postdoctoral fellow, Crystal Massey, who actually is a, a McGill OT um, graduate. And then at the VA, which provides most of the space and equipment um, to our studies. Um, Richard Macko is the head of our Maryland Exercise and Robotics Center of Excellence. He does a lot of work on exercise and lower extremity ro robotics. And then we have um, therapists who are involved in the interventions and, and assessments. I was also recently on sabbatical in, in Belgium at um, KU Leuven um, because I, I felt I needed to learn more about how to do work in motor control. I'd sort of gotten into it, but never had gotten the training. And so I really appreciate uh, my co-promoters, as they're called, um, um, Stefan Swinnen and Ilse Jankers. Another thing I was, I was also very uh, appealing about working there was, was actually having um, someone who could actually build things, um, an electronics and mechanical um, construction um, guy, for lack of a better term, but who, who could really um, build a presentation device powered off of a parallel port of a 20-year-old PC and, and give you the basic programming for it. So um, we don't, unfortunately, have that in, in Baltimore. We also work with um, engin engineers, um, including Peter Lum, who um, is at Catholic University of America, who has helped program our robotic control systems used for some of the work you'll see. And uh, we have a new collaboration um, at the University of Maryland, which is more in the Washington, D.C. area, um, um, Rodolfo Chantilly, who's, um, who does some very creative work on, on using uh, machine learning to, to predict um, the state of the brain based on EEG signals. And um, we get funding from a variety of uh, federal sources and, and foundation sources. And we're grateful to them as well for the, the volunteers who participate in our studies. So what will I be talking about? Um, it's actually really, um, really just two projects, but also introducing that with um, reaching as a fundamental movement pattern that's important to, to study, um, for both for the sake of rehabilitation and um, because of uh, motor control in general. and then. Um, not in the order in which I did them, but um, because I think it makes sense this way, talking first about um, the brain activity related to reaching in three dimensions without any support, so a, a kind of natural reaching um, behavior. And then, um, and then the less natural behavior, which is reaching in two dimensions um, in a rehabilitation robot and with brain stimulation. You know, part of my, my background, um, the PhD work was really in neuroethology, where one of the fundamental principles is that if you're interested in a behavior, find an animal that does it well. So if you're interested in auditory localization, study an owl. But humans are actually um, better at some things than, than uh, most other animals, and reaching would be one of them. This is our, our dog, um, Shackleton, on the, on the left in a sort of typical posture. And you can just tell from the way he's holding his forepaws that he's not really ready to reach. And now, if he's given enough, enough motivation, he will, um, he will reach a point in space. It, it looks awkward from my point of view. And um, you know, when he tries to stabilize something with his paws, it's, um, it, it frequently fails. As opposed to um, a, a human there reaching for the brass ring at, in a carousel, um, it's a complicated task, involves, um, involves posture and, um, and multiple movements not under the control of the person. And yet, um, she's successfully able to reach for the ring.
So what, what is reaching? If you think about reaching the um, end point of the hand, so a, a finger, to a point in space, you realize that it's a, it's a complicated problem. There, there are multiple joints involved, and this just shows you a setup from someone else's kinematic experiment. So with all these markers on, on um, limb segments and, and joints, there are quite a number of degrees of freedom that can be measured. And with the goal to just get the finger or a tool held in the hand to a particular point in space. And so this, this problem is complicated by many things, but it's, but it's complicated particularly by the problem of abundance. So um, only motor control people would consider abundance a problem, but, um, but, but what it means is just the problem that there are too many solutions for the, for the problem. So in order to get your hand into space, there are a variety of ways you can, you can do that. And yet you, you tend to choose one of them with a certain amount of variation around that, that solution. And so why, why that particular solution and why that particular type of variation? So the solution to the abundance problem is one of, of synergies. What that means is that instead of putting together a um, number of solutions of joint positions and finding the ones that work, what you actually do is you activate a small number, and by small I mean three or three to five um, types of activation patterns of, of muscles that tend to get the limb in a particular position or create a velocity. I, won't, I don't, don't want to tie myself down to that. What this shows you is actually um, muscle activation patterns that represent a, um, some of these synergies, so the elbow flexion synergy. So that, that's a pretty simple one to understand. But what's shown across the right here is, is um, the expression of this muscle activation pattern throughout a variety of behaviors that involve variable load, variable position, um, starting position of the arm. And what you can see is that th it almost looks exactly the same. The amount of activation that you extract out of that synergy when you break down the muscle activation into this small number of synergies is essentially the same. Um, another way to look at uh, reaching movements is not from looking at the muscle activity or brain activity, but, but just looking at the kinematics. And this has been done for over 100 years. So Woodworth um, came up with a theory about why there's a um, particular type of accuracy in, in voluntary movements in general and reaching movements in particular. Um, and some of the terminology is a bit outdated, but the, the initial adjustment, as he called it, uh, might be called the ballistic um, part of the movement, the pre-programmed phase where the goal is to cover a certain amount of distance and actually cover um, a majority of the distance to the target. So um, the idea about this phase was that it, it was pre-programmed, as, as the slide implies, and that once you planned it, you just sort of threw your, your limb out into, into space. But, um, but that didn't get you completely to the target. And then there was what was called current control, or it could be called a homing phase, in which the error, in other words, the distance between the the hand position on the target was then, was then reduced. Um, the, this um, theory um, being around for more than 100 years, there's been some refinement. And um, some of that has um, been because of the recognition that the, this early phase is actually not immune to corrections. So um, there can be early corrections um, to the actual impulse that's, that, that's given. Um, and then it's thought to be through an internal model, because some of these corrections happen too quickly to be the, the result of, of sensory, sensory feedback. So that the idea is that you've, um, you've predicted what sort of action will happen in the arm. Um, it starts happening, and then there's this, this calculation that the, that, the, um, that that movement is not um, entirely adequate, and that that, that gets corrected. And, and other things can happen, um, such as the target changing in the, in the meantime, which could also, some of these corrections can happen very early. Um, the, other, the other idea is that there's some optimized um, sub-movements, so that, um, that the, even though it looks like a reaching movement looks like a single smooth movement, um, it does include at least two phases, and, and that the, um, the sub-movements um, have a balance between um, producing a force, a, a movement that um, will get to the right, um, generally to the right place um, quickly versus the error in the movement. So if you reduce the, the requirements for force generation, you also reduce the error. So an example of just what happens with the sub-movements, if you look at the first sub-movement, you'll see that, that every movement, regardless of which of these four targets is, um, is being reached to, up, down, forward, and backward targets, it's always less than the actual required movement. So the required, the distance to the target is indicated here, about 152 millimeters, 
the average movement is always less than that, and it's actually um, least for for when the target is down. So that in reaching to a target that's that's down, the first um, movement doesn't get to you, um, you know, much more than halfway to that target, and then the rest of the movement is is a is an additional movement. This may make sense on a kind of laziness principle in which the downward movement, um, continued downward movement, movement is carried through by gravity, and so you're letting gravity um, do the work, so you're reducing the amount of, of effortful work needed to do in the first place. If you look at the brain areas that are involved in movement planning and execution and reaching in general, there's a, um, a set of um, cortical and, and subcortical areas that are involved. Um, I've used this figure on the left for, for a few years to try to show both where things are anatomically and, and also their, their connections. Just focusing on, on how you get from intention to move to action. Um, intention is happening somewhere um, in the frontal lobes and action happening in the cortical spinal tract in, in a good approximation. Um, but I realized when I was drawing this out that there wasn't anything implied about what's going through these, these connections. And so I made some labels on, on the right to show you what, what you could at least think about based on the literature and what I you know, really want to do is really refine this, this sort of model over, over time. So the first thing is that the primary motor cortex, um, M1, is the um, final common output for most types of voluntary movements. Not the only, not the only one, but um, certainly a dominant one. It's receiving information about desired force <clears throat> and direction um, from, from other, other areas. Um, it's receiving information about action plans from the dorsal premotor area, um, visual corrections from the ventral premotor area, and, um, and then the cerebellum is very much involved in corrections and updates, but um, relays all of its effects on movement essentially, um, in this case, through the, through the thalamus, so through, these, um, through basically a, sub, a subcortical um, loop. The supplementary motor area is involved in many things. You see it active in many types of movement, but it has a particular role in, in um, timing and sequence. And then as you get further forward, it's more about choice of movement, inhibition of undesired movements, um, and things like that. So there are a lot of things you could say about that. Um, brainstem areas, like in, such as in the pons and um, medulla, um, can actually produce movements of the forelimb, but they, they tend to produce more um, flexor activity and it's more bilateral and more postural. may be involved in recovery after stroke, um, but, um, but it's not, a, not usually part of uh, skilled distal movement. So this is the reaching in 3D space that I said I would talk about, and which, we, which we did in, in Leuven. This is a um, three-target board that has LEDs to indicate both a ready signal and a go signal. They're, the signal turns um, green for the particular target that's, that the person is reaching to. And then there are uh, markers in EMG used to measure, measure activity. I'll talk a little bit more about the actual task in a second. When we went into this project, the idea was that particular cortical areas would have a role in reaching in three dimensions, and that these um, these areas would be specific to certain parts of the reaching. That the, that the SMA would, would have an earlier um, role in reaching and it would be more postural and anti-gravity than, than ballistic. Um, so that it would be involved in, in keeping the arm up essentially in, in, in space. That um, the premotor area, specifically dorsal premotor area, would have a, more of a role in, in the aiming movements um, based on, on many previous, previous studies and in visual motor um, coordination in general that um, primary motor cortex was essentially a positive um, control that if you can't affect an ongoing reaching movement in primary motor cortex, then, then something's wrong. And that the, um, we um, actually spend a lot of time thinking about what a good control region of the brain is. You can't assume that any part of the brain has, does nothing. But um, we used the, um, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex ipsilateral to the move, moved hand as a, as a control. Probably not a perfect, perfect control, but, but something fairly far upstream from, it, from an actual reach. Part of the, these hypotheses was that, that that timing was very important, that this would be a very dynamic process, and that um, the, particularly the EMG output that was affected by per perturbing these areas would depend on the timing of the perturbation. So that in some cases, if you're ready to move but not moving yet, there'd be an element of response inhibition um, during that waiting period versus um, releasing the activity and having a, an ongoing motor command. And then that the trajectories actually taken by the hand would actually re reflect 
um, effects on posture and, and on accuracy of, of aiming. Um, given that this, there's a fairly short time to do this, this work, on really a few months, we um, had to make some compromises. Um, as you can imagine, there, you could have a lot of different targets in space to reach to um, when you're dealing with three-dimensional reaching, but we decided just to concentrate on a vertical aspect and a forward, forward reach. The reaches were made to, to one of these um, three targets in a pseudo-random um, sequence with 24 trials by testing the location of... Um, of perturbation and repeated multiple times. Um, so I didn't say before how we were perturbing these brain areas, and the idea was to use transcranial magnetic stimulation, which I'm not going to really talk about the principles, but some of you may be familiar with, um, is a method of inducing an electric current in the brain by a um, rapidly varying strong magnetic, magnetic field um, at the scalp. And so in order to, to do this, you need to localize the, the brain targets. This can be done stereotactically using a person's own brain imaging, but um, in this case um, we localized with respect to localization of the motor representation in primary motor cortex using the biceps to localize uh, the arm area and, um, and therefore also the premotor area and then um, the tibialis anterior leg muscle representation to, to localize the um, border of the motor cortex on the medial wall of the of the brain, and, and the, thus getting the supplementary motor area just ahead of that. I also said um, you could do an infinite number of timings, but we we had um, three different timings, um, stimulating at minus 50, 100, and 250 milliseconds with respect to a go cue. So some of this during the um, reaction time period, some of it, some of this during the waiting period, and um, and some of it during an ongoing movement. Um, we gave a train of pulses, two pulses, 100 milliseconds apart. I actually wanted to give three, but there are, um, in, in Belgium, you can only give three pulses of TMS if you're in a clinical setting and we are in a mo motion capture lab. And then um, we adjusted the stimulation strength so that the stimulation um, never produced an actual motor evoked potential, so n never strongly enough that it was actually activating motor cortex and, and producing electrical activity in the muscles that way. I talked about the control region, which we um, stimulated, again, below the mo motor threshold, so ensuring that it wouldn't be very strong stimulation, but would have, a, have an effect. Um, so this was the mapping part of the study, so a simple kind of swim cap with, with a grid, and you see those little marks to indicate where the, some of the targets were that were calculated relative to the motor mapping. We actually had two groups in terms of ages. I'm only going to talk about the younger group. It'll be very interesting to see how the older group relates, but I, I won't even bring up some of the um, interesting observations in that group. But we had a younger group of, with an average age of, of 25, um, a mixture of males and um, females, and the study was for, for right-handers. So I'll just present the um, EMG analysis um, first. It's, it, it might seem a little bit backwards, but in some ways it's easier to understand and it was actually easier to actually accomplish <clears throat> first. What this um, involved was, was um, examining changes in EMG activity related to stimulation, stimulation trials versus no stimulation trials in the areas, that were, the, the regions that I, that I mentioned. Um, it shows you some of the technical aspects um, of it. One, one nice thing about the motion capture system, which was a Vicon system, is that it um, took in information about both the timing of the visual cues as well as the stimulation. So that time series of data of, of EMG, um, kinematics, um, also included events and, and stimulation. So there was no problem in terms of, of synchronization. Um, and for the purposes, purposes of this analysis, we're just looking at um, six bins of activity, in, um, in other words, uh, 300 milliseconds of, a, of EMG activity, um, looking for the most proximal effects of the, of the EMG stimulation. Um, we didn't normalize to maximum voluntary contraction, um, but all the comparisons were within a, within a subject, um, own EMG. Just shows you what an entire 24 reach um, session looks like in terms of EMG activity, going from more proximal muscles to more um, distal muscles. Um, can't really make much out of that except to see that um, EMG activity goes up and down during each trial. Um, if you look at a single trial, you'll see there, there are phases of, of activity. So for the most part, there's relative silence before the reach um, starts. 
this um, represents the start of the reach. You can actually see stimulation artifacts here um, where the TMS occurred. And then um, in some muscles, there was some activity when the target was reached and the, and the hands um, stopped. I should mention that all the, the reaches um, were timed in a way that people didn't do the quickest reach that they could, but actually had to reach within uh, one um, second interval and um, had lights that would show them when they should, should arrive at the reaching board. And they had plenty of practice and um, feedback on every single trial so that they were getting the timing um, about right. And then the um, nice thing about the script for analyzing this is that there was automatic events detection. So this shows you MATLAB's output for when it found the, the, the ready cue, the um, start cue, and the end cue for the, for the movements, and when the trigger pulses to the TMS um, occurred. The nice thing about that is that even if something went wrong with the sequence generation, this provided an, an independent way to ensure that um, you knew exactly what the timing was of the stimulation with respect to the, to the movement cues. So we talked about having the, the EMG activity measured within bins of activity. Um, this just shows you during a single reach trial with no stimulation what the EMG activity was in six of the nine muscles that we, that we recorded. What you see is that the activity stays low before um, the actual reach, except in the trapezius, which is probably not too surprising. It provides a sort of postural stabilization um, to, the, to the shoulder. Um, and then everything else was um, started at, with um, different time courses, including the biceps as the first activity. These are all forward reaches, so you might think it's unusual to see biceps activity as being that dominant. There's actually very little triceps activity. But these reaches are against gravity, and so the, um, the role of the biceps in actually lifting the arm um, and providing this kind of controlled um, extension is actually quite, quite important. So that represents one big difference between um, reaching supported and, and unsupported. So um, all of the average DMG activity for all of these younger subjects at all of these bins went into one large um, ANOVA, which found main effects for, um, for many of the factors that we thought would be important, including the stimulation time, showed effects in all muscles except for the extensor digitorum communis, and then uh, the stimulation site, so whether it was motor cortex or premotor area or SMA, for instance, was important in two of the muscles, the, the biceps, as I said, a, um, you know, an actual important part of reaching forward in, in an unsupported way, and, um, and the extensor digitorum communis, which would be important in keeping the finger up as they reach to the, to the targets. And then the, um, the target height, so whether which were one of those three ones it was, and then the time after stimulation mattered in, in all muscles. So you know, we got a sense that the, um, the stimulation made a difference, and it was dependent on time and, and sight. So then looking at what that means, I really saw that this important role of the biceps in controlling the early, early parts of reach. And this was kind of the, um, the out output we got, and I do have to orient you to this to make, to make sense of it. So what's shown in the x-axis is the site of stimulation in the order of um, M1, PMAD, SMA, and, and then the, this ipsilateral um, prefrontal cortex. And then the, the zero line for positive differences in EMG activity with stimulation versus without stimulation is there. So on average, there was more EMG activity with the, with the stimulation, but it was greatest for the second stimulation site, the, the um, PMAD. If you look at that um, further to see what's, what's happening in time, so now looking at these um, six bins of times, and that, that's now on the, the x-axis. So what you, what you see here is that um, you wouldn't expect um, any differences in the first two bins because the stimulation hasn't occurred yet, so that's, that's good. And then once the stimulation occurs, there's more activity um, in the, mostly in the middle window, middle panel, which is actually the 100 millisecond after the go cue, so really just at the start of the, of the reach. And then it, it goes down by 250 milliseconds, which is the, the third panel. So there's a very dynamic representation in the um, dorsal premotor area that um, has a facilitatory effect with stimulation um, really at, at the immediate start of the, of the reach. It is always greatest in, in premotor area. Motor cortex cause, causes some similar activity, and then it's least in, in our control area. So the conclusions from this study is that um, muscle rep representations are modulated dy dynamically, um, and it does depend on, on what movement is planned and at what stage of the reach it's, um, it's in. The dorsal premotor area was the one that we could perturb the most in a facilitatory manner. I mean, 
we didn't really know that ahead of time because TMS can have mixed excitatory and inhibitory effects, but at, at this very early stage of the reach, it was probably activating, giving more activation to those neurons that were already activated in that, in that area. But the other motor areas, M1 and SMA, were also um, involved. I didn't show you this specifically, but SMA did have proximal effects. So it was um, biceps um, and not extensor digitorum communis as, a, as opposed to the premotor area, which affected both of those muscles. Um, but the effects were smaller, and there was a question about how effectively you can reach the SMA with stimulation over the middle part of the, of the head. Um, and as I said, we had a predominance of facilitatory effects rather than inhibitory. Um, in terms of the kinematic data, this just shows you a little uh, picture of what the sort of modeling of the movement that you get um, with out of uh, Vicon system. So that's reaching to a middle target. So, um, so basically, this for, out of this you can get um, positions of of the um, finger, which is um, over here, um, all of the elbow angles, um, orientations of the limb segments, um, etc. Even though these figures are a little bit hard, at least they're in the same sort of format as the, the EMG um, figures. So we're, we're looking at net now just at the um, elevation of the finger in space and how that's affected by, by stimulation um, at, these, at this, these different times. The time shifted a little bit forward because we know that the, any effects on muscle activity will, will have some delay in terms of actually showing an effect on trajectory. And so what you see here is for um, the, the three different um, reach targets, um, with one being the highest um, target, two being the middle target, and three the lower target, that um, for three different stimulation times, there is um, an effect of, of stimulation, um, in this case in the um, motor cortex, with an actual increase in elevation of the finger, particularly late, later into the reach. For the dorsal premotor area, you actually have somewhat of an earlier um, an effect, again, reflecting a sort of earlier part of, the, of that um, brain and the plan to move, at least that's our, that's our interpretation. So um, with the SMA, is actually the one case in which we got a, um, a downward movement, um, which was actually the, the hypothesis that it was involved in this kind of anti-gravity postural, postural part of the reaching, at least um, you know, in, the, in the later stimulation, not in, not in every case. So um, this, is a, this actually is in a more preliminary stage of analysis, but um, in this case, we actually see greater kinematic effects of stimulation um, later um, as opposed to the EMG effects. And I think one way to think about this is there's less ch chance to compensate. Even though you can modulate EMG early on, um, there's this forward model and this, this rapid change that once the hand is kind of thrown out into space, um, then, then you can actually um, see more actual effects on, on hand position. The effects of stimulation of the M1 and premotor areas are actually to increase the planned output, um, activating things more that are already activated, whereas SMA does induce this loss of, of posture. Not as early as we probably predicted, but, but it, it does seem to have that, that role, which is a relatively new, unique finding in this case. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the, the reaching in two dimensions with using a rehabilitation robot and also brain stimulation. Why do we do this study? One reason is because of experience with people who have had a stroke who are actually practicing in a rehabilitation robot. And then what you see, if, um, when people perform this kind of uh, center out task, so you see where there are these different targets around the red dot, they're actually trying to move the robot handle to move a cursor to those, to those targets. What happens when they do that? You often see a, um, a rapid improvement. So this shows multiple trajectories superimposed, but at visit one, the, the center of the um, stimulation is actually over here, and so they're not reaching to the majority of the targets. They can reach to other ones, but sometimes in a very fragmented um, way. By visit two, it's about the same, and by visit three, and we're talking about one hour of visits you know, within a week, they're now reaching to all, all targets, and the quality of movement is still not normal, but it's better than it was before, and then that's retained by, by visit four, more, more or less. So um, how do people get, get uh, so much better? Um, in the robots, they're doing it with assistance, so the robot is providing um, a kind of a, is a control system known as impedance control, where it gets them to the um, to target even if, even if they can't do it themselves. In, in these figures, it's totally unassisted, so this is all their voluntary effort. That would, that would be a trivial reason to explain why they can get to the target if it's just the robot helping them, but it's not. 
So the, you know, the gaps in knowledge in this case are what brain areas are, are responsible for this, this sort of rapid improvement? Why is the improvement so inadequate in so many? Because for every patient like this, there are many others who don't improve at all you know, after tw um, 12 weeks of, of robotic training. And you know, in, in, many, right, in many cases, there's just no change. And then is there some way to augment robotic rehabilitation with other, other methods? So can we kind of enhance brain plasticity is basically what it comes, comes down to. Can, um, can stimulation of the brain um, make the movement preparation better? And or, or make the execution better, um, and can make the effect of practice more long-lasting, even if the effects aren't aren't immediate. Um, and are there any undesirable effects? Because certainly, transcranial magnetic stimulation is a kind of blunt tool. It's it's just causing an electric field in the brain, um, activating some neur neurons, inhibiting others. Um, but it's certainly not specific for just those that are involved in a in a behavior. So um, the way this started is by first uh, seeing what sort of movements were evoked in the arm with TMS with a normal subject at rest in one of these rehabilitation robots and mapping out the motor cortex, or just really mapping out over the scalp, over a three by three grid and seeing what sort of movements that people had. And um, then we measured the movement threshold, so um, where you're able to get movements of a certain size with the least amount of stimulation. And then measure the responses on each external stimulation position with um, stimuli that were uh, that were 120 percent of the movement threshold. We um, used the the fact that the robot can provide any forces you want to create a virtual spring field that would keep the hands in the center so that that the subject could always be at rest um, and wouldn't have to worry about bringing the hand back and have you know varying amounts of activity um, in terms of movement and tension. So it um, shows you some of the setup. Again, the arm robot, um, this, the things used for stereotactic localization, the grid projected in, um, in this case, on a, um, either the person's own MRI or a, or a template MRI. And it's, this is a stimulation coil. And what we found is mapping um, the movements that you get with stimulation at these nine different scalp locations is um, what you see here is in two different subjects, the movements that are evoked. So you can see a difference between the movements evoked on the left and the right. Um, but with, within each subject, the um, simulation location mattered mainly for amplitude. Um, so that movements were, were evoked, um, these vectors represent movements, or these lines represent movements from a common center. And they tended to be stereotype movements in a particular quadrant of, of space, or even less than a quadrant. So um, we were able to evoke proximal arm movements in an arm robot, which was actually was, a, was fairly novel. They, they varied between subjects mostly, and by location to a certain extent, but were consistent. And um, one question is, you know, why, why only movements in a particular direction? Going into this, there was, um, I had the thought that by varying the position of stimulation, we might get movements in different directions. And for the most part, that wasn't, wasn't true. Um, is this because of anatomy, because the arm movement map is, orient, is organized in a certain way by movements and we're only accessing part of it um, from, the, from the surface? Or is it physiology where um, there's a particular movement direction that's kind of most favored? And I'll show you that I think it's more physiological than, than anatomical constraints. Why it's different between individuals is another, is another question. By the way, we did ask people about their hobbies and you know, particular activities because um, having done some studies before in, in motor mapping, um, there were some intriguing you know, um, differences between people based on kind of their, their motor activity. Um, so um, you know, some people do a lot of things with their, with their legs. They're runners and soccer players, and you know, it, it seemed to make a, a difference. So then the, effect, the question was, you know, how does practice affect the, the motor map? Which actually gets to the issue about whether it's physiology or anatomy, because if you can change it, then it's more likely the physiology. And um, there's a previous literature on thumb movements that Joseph Klassen started when he was working with Leo Cohn, that if you, um, if you do that same sort of TMS and look at thumb movements, people will tend to have a stereotyped um, thumb movement every time you stimulate. But if they practice movements in the opposite direction, then um, for several minutes afterwards, then stimulation at the same spot will produce movements in that other, that other direction, which will gradually go back to their, to their original. But um, yeah, so then the question about time course, durability, you know, comes up. And yeah, then since you can 
measure muscle activation, does that do changes in muscle activation produced by TMS explain changes in, in um, actual gross arm direction? So here's the setup. Um, again, the familiar with the robot. We had two different baseline um, measurements separated by five minutes. Practice of 240, um, 160 um, reaches to, to a single target that was opposite in direction from their average original evoked direction. Then a, a, again, um, re-measurement of the TMS evoked movements, more practice, re-measurement, more practice, measurement, and then another waiting period for retention. The outcome parameters were the actual um, movements, which is actually not, not so simple. I mean, they, they produce movements. There's also the spring field moving them back to the center. The spring field was, was lessened. We couldn't take it away entirely, or the arm would drift um, at the outset of the movement. But we wanted to measure um, this kind of ballistic part of the movement. So we measured the, the handle position at the peak velocity of the TMS evoked movement. And that's what's demonstrated here. So peak velocity is here. Um, this represents the peak velocity of the return movement, which is all, all the robot, or mostly the robot. Um, this shows you the, these, these kind of looping trajectories they take and where we kind of measure those directions. So not, not always the greatest excursion, but um, with the points where it was dominated by the initial movement produced by, by TMS. Um, so we can measure the amplitude of the movement, the direction of the, the movement, and then changes um, between a baseline um, position, angle, um, whatever we wanted to measure, and the post-practice um, movements. Just to you know, simply show you a set of movements from our, some of the earliest experiments um, with this kind of fractionated training, there was a progression over time um, in this particular subject. So the baseline movements were, were away and to the, to the left. Um, and then after training, they got to be smaller and away and to the, and to the right, and then, and then went back. If you look at a group study, this, um, this shows the, the angle where the angle is normalized to um, 180 degrees for the starting position. So you know, whenever you measure things in, in a circle, it becomes complicated because um, you know, a 10 degree movement one way might, might move you from, um, from 5 degrees to minus 5 degrees or you know, 355 degrees. And how do you measure the difference? So in this case, um, all the movements were normalized so that um, at the second baseline period, they were 180 degrees, and that's why there's no variation um, here. Um, what this shows you is how much stability there is in, in five minutes, so that the measurements before, for the most part, was in the same location. There's one, one outlier here. But then after the start of practice, you can see that the, the angle of the handle movement is changed for some of the subjects, but not others. So these in this middle are, have no change. Others have you know, tremendous change and, and almost complete opposite movements evoked by TMS afterwards. And then for the most part, these changes are retained over time. Another way of looking at it, maybe a little bit simpler, is just um, how far does it move the points at which the handle is um, moved at maximum velocity by TMS. There's a little bit of variation at baseline, but then um, there's some displacement after the start of practice, and which never never goes back to, to the original position. And if you're looking at the scale, you might see these are relatively small movements, but um, it's in the context of, of um, the whole uh, mass of the arm and the robot and the fact that we actually have a spring field resisting the, the movements. So um, they're measurable. They're just, they're just very small. So the conclusions from this study that um, there is some variation over time in TMS evoked movements, but actually, you know, in having now studies in which people have come back again and again, the, the, these movements are actually remarkably consistent over, over time, um, over the course of weeks. But then the, the directions and endpoints are significantly different after practice. Um, I didn't show you the MEP data, the motor evoked potentials, but there is some change in the balance of agonists and antagonists from the movement that does partly explain, but not completely explains, the changes in uh, movement, which is partly because it turns out to be much more complicated than for a single joint movement, like, like around the, the thumb. And then other, on the other hand, there are people who are resistant to practice-related pl plasticity or just don't change. You might look at it as a downside, but it's also an opportunity to, to test um, interventions. In the thumb paradigm, amphetamine was useful at rap greatly increasing the speed and durability of, of practice-related um, plasticity. But in our case, stimulation does. 
But we did do a study of, um, of adding stimulation to the, the practice. And we tested the effect of timing and stimulation of looking at the um, at stimulating during the late reaction time period or early movement period, as had been done in other paradigms, versus a random control. And um, first of all, the, the effect on the direction in which the movements occurred didn't matter by which um, stimulation paradigm you use. So um, pre-movement period, EMG triggered, random, people all had an average uh, 60 um, degree change in the, in the TMS evoked movements. But if you look at the amplitude of the TMS evoked movements with practice, the movements almost doubled with pre-movement stimulation and essentially didn't change with EMG triggered with random being in the middle, and these, these effects were significant. The actual um, EMG activity that was evoked by TMS was actually um, more different in qualitatively in the sense that um, pre-movement stimulation actually increased motor evoked potentials. EMG triggered, so EMG triggered being after this actual definite activity in muscles actually reduced activity in this case in elbow agonists. Conclusions from this is that, um, that stimulation um, can affect practice effects. So we're, and we're stimulating every, once every 10 seconds during movements, not even during all movements, but it had this really powerful effect on practice-related plas plasticity with the, um, with the earlier stimulation increasing um, motor output and, and um, later decreasing it, which makes total sense if you're familiar with uh, spike timing de dependent plasticity like LTP. Um, but um, you know, it's really one of the few demonstrations that in a, in a kind of more systems level in, in motor cortex that this actually, um, this actually works. What's actually interesting is that the balance of change in synergies, getting back to the synergy hypothesis, is not really affected by the stimulation um, time. So it's a it's kind of dissociating amplitude from more balance of, of output activity. But I, th I think that it does provide what may be a useful means to enhance practice in stroke where the amount of movement is often in inadequate, um, that you could actually influence um, that, at least in the sort of representation of movements by, by this sort of combined practice and stimulation. I just want to leave you with a few final thoughts. So um, reaching is a fundamental movement. Um, the motor cortex is kind of the hub of reaching in terms of what's coming into it and what's going out of it, but that these other, other areas like the pre dorsal premotor area are very important and have a different dynamic than motor cortex in their control of, of reaching. And that dynamics is, um, is very um, important if, you can, if you're considering how to use stimulation to um, affect treatment so that um, I think in the future we should be able to use this dynamic activity to actually come up with protocols that improve reaching and, and activities of daily living um, for people with stroke. Thank you very much.